Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to discuss sophists and sophistry. Particularly, I'm going to be using the context of Plato's dialogue Euthydemus, which recounts one of Socrates' many encounters with his eternal rivals, the sophists. So, for a little background on the sophists and sophistry in general, uh, sophistry is uh, what we would call today something like a school of philosophy. But it is one which Plato explicitly rejected as philosophical. In fact, he saw it as something of an antithesis to philosophy proper. Philosophy, as Plato understood it, was uh, the love of wisdom. This is an idea that he got from his teacher Socrates. By contrast, sophistry is the practice of being wise, the practice of knowing things, and the practice of teaching things. At least that's what it is, theoretically. Practically speaking, it was the technique of convincing people. It is what Aristotle would go on to call rhetoric. So the sophists were typically rhetoricians. They were speakers, public speakers, whether that is political, whether that is legal, or in some cases, like the example we see in the dialogue, uh, military. These were even military generals, people whose practice was to convince people uh, and to sway people's opinions over what ought to be done, even on the field of battle, whether that's there or in law courts or in the uh, in the public arena, in the public square, uh, the, the agora, or wherever else, uh, or even in private conversations, teaching, like the example we see in the Youth Demas. Now, these were uh, the sophists, that at least those that we, oh angel, <laughs> those that we encounter in uh, in. Uh, Plato's dialogues, uh, both in this dialogue and in others, most notably the, uh, the Gorgias and a few others. Um, the sophists we see are not settled in one place. Uh, they have no, to borrow a Latin term, no patria, no homeland, no city, no state to call their own. They are, to use a more modern turn of phrase, citizens of the world, uh, or at least citizens of Greece uh, at the time, which I mean, for Plato's audience, was the world, so close enough. Uh, they are, to borrow another Greek term perhaps, rootless cosmopolitans, uh, as I might derogatorily call them. They popularized the phrase, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Phrases like this, things like this, where one is meant to fit in wherever one goes by mimicking and altering, uh, by mimicking the behaviors by mimicking the arguments and the ideas of wherever one goes. And so one does not have a stable system of thought. One rather has techniques for convincing. And these could be uh, applied to convince an audience or an individual of anything. Whatever was depend whatever was important, whatever they thought was beneficial, they could convince you of. And so they were, uh, well, one of the more common professions uh, for, uh, for sophists at the time uh, were politicians and lawyers, people who were, uh, whose job it was to convince people of things, even if they had no particularly good reason to think that those things were true. And so, of course, in addition to Plato's dialogues, uh, we see sophists and people acting like sophists throughout all of history to this day. Uh, we see a great many politicians and lawyers who do this very sort of thing. And so, of course, this is a uh, certainly a relevant topic for consideration even now, uh, perhaps even more so than some of the other things that I, uh, that I discuss on this channel, things that might appear a bit more esoteric. And so, this dialogue in particular that I want to read portions from to sort of give us an idea of the kind of exchanges that could happen between uh, between a philosopher, someone who is, uh, like Socrates, who is pursuing truth, pursuing wisdom, out of a love for the truth, out of a love for wisdom, out of a love for gaining knowledge. An exchange between that, on the one hand, and a sophist, or sophists, uh, on the other, who are merely concerned with convincing, regardless of whether it's true or false, or both or neither, um, to the point where they, at some, t at some points, uh, are are explicitly attempting to convince of logical contradictions to the point where they're, practically speaking, rejecting the fundamental laws of logic itself, non-contradiction, excluded middle. And so, 
uh, this dialogue is uh, is sort of a frame story where Socrates is trying to convince his friend Crito, both of whom are old men at this point, uh, to begin taking lessons from these young upstart uh, teachers, uh, the titular Euthydemus and his older brother Dionysodorus. Uh, and in the process of doing so, uh, he wants an example of their method of teaching. He wants to see what they can do uh, to convince him and then to therefore convey the message to his friend Crito. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to see what kind of technique this is that is that they are calling wisdom, or, or perhaps even the height of wisdom. And so I want to read, like I said, a few sections of this so we can see an example of what it is that, uh, that uh, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus are doing, uh, the kind of conversations that they are having here. Um, I'm going to put up some images here, uh, just sort of as filler through my narration. Um, just as a just to kind of keep track of who's speaking that sort of thing. It's not images of uh, of these figures because of them, um, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus were not well known historically speaking. They existed; they were real people. Um, but it's not like we have marble busts we could put up like we could for Socrates. So I'll just select some images at random, um, perhaps pulled from the headlines of today. <clears throat> But if you're willing to answer my question, Socrates, I will prove that you agree to these remarkable things, too. But there is nothing I would like better than to be refuted on these points. Because if I'm unaware of my own wisdom, but you are going to demonstrate that I know everything and know it forever, what greater godsend than this would I likely to come across my whole life long? Then answer. Ask away, I'm ready. Well then, Socrates, when you have knowledge, do you have it of something, or not? I have it of something. And do you know by means of that by which you have knowledge, or by means of something else? By means of that by which I have knowledge. I suppose you mean the soul, or isn't this that what you have in mind? Aren't you ashamed, Socrates, to be asking a question of your very own when you ought to be answering? <laughs> Very well, but how am I to act? I will do just what you tell me. Now, whenever I don't understand your question, do you want me to answer just the same, without inquiring further about it? You surely grasp something of what I say, don't you? Yes, I do. Then answer in terms of what you understand. Well then... If you ask a question with one thing in mind, and I understand it with another, and then answer in terms of the latter, will you be satisfied if I answer nothing to the purpose? I shall be satisfied, although I don't suppose you will. Then I'm certainly not going to answer until I understand the question. You're evading a question you understand all along, because you keep talking nonsense and are practically senile. Well, Euthydemus... If you think this is how to do things, we must do them your way, because you're far more of an expert at discoursing than I, who have merely a layman's knowledge of the art. So go back and ask your questions from the beginning. And you answer again from the beginning. Do you know what you know by means of something, or not? I know by means of the soul. There he is again, adding on something to the question. I didn't ask you by what means you know, but whether you know by means of something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did give too much of an answer again, because I'm so uneducated. Please forgive me, I and I shall answer simply, that I know what I know by means of something. And do you always know by this same means? Or is it rather the case that you know something by this means and sometimes by another? Always, whenever I know, it is by this means. Won't you stop adding things on again? But I'm afraid this word always may trip us up. It won't do it to us, but to you if anyone. Come along and answer. Do you always know by this means? Always, since I have to withdraw the whenever then you always know by this means. And since you are always knowing, the next question is, do you know some things by this means by which you know, and others by some other means, or everything by this one? Absolutely everything by this one. 
those that I know, that is. There it is again. Here comes the same qualification. Well, I take back the those that I know. No, don't take back a single thing. I'm not asking you any favors. Just answer me this. Would you be capable of knowing absolutely everything if you did not know everything? It would be remarkable if I did. Then add on everything you like now, because you admit that you know absolutely everything. It seems that I do, especially since my those that I know has no effect, and I know everything. And you have also admitted that you always know by means of that by which you know, whenever you know, or however else you like to put it, because you have admitted that you always know and know all things at the same time. It is obvious that you knew even when you were a child, and when you were born, and when you were being conceived. And before you yourself came into being, and before the foundation of heaven and earth, you knew absolutely everything. If it's true that you always knew, and by heaven you said, you will always know, and will know everything, if I want it that way. I, I hope you'll want it that way, most honorable Euthydemus. If you're genuinely telling the truth, but I don't quite believe your ability to bring it off unless your brother Dionysodorus here should lend a helping hand. Perhaps the two of you might be able to do it. Tell me, with respect to other things, I see no possibility of disputing with men of so prodigious wisdom by saying that I do not know everything, since you have stated that I do. But what about things of this sort, Euthydemus? How shall I say I know that good men are unjust? Come tell me, I do I know this or not? Oh yes, you know it. Know what? Good men are unjust. Yes, I've always known that. But this isn't my question. What I'm asking is, where did I learn that the good are unjust? Nowhere. Then this is something I do not know. You're ruining the argument. And this fellow here will turn out to be not knowing. And then he will be knowing and not knowing at the same time. But you... what do you say, Euthydemus? Your all-knowing brother doesn't appear to be making a mistake, does he? Am I a brother to Euthydemus? Let that pass, my good friend, until Euthydemus instructs me as to how I know that good men are unjust. Don't begrudge me this piece of information. You're running away, Socrates, and refusing to answer. And with good reason, because I am weaker than either of you, so that I do not hesitate to run away from you both together. I am much more worthless than Heracles, who was unable to fight it with both the Hydra, a kind of lady sophist who was so clever that if anyone cut off one of, one of her heads of argument, she put forward many more in its place. With another sort of sophist, a crab arrived on the shore of the sea, rather recently, I think. And when Heracles was in distress because this creature was chattering and biting at his left, he called for his nephew, Iolaus, to come and help him, which Iolaus successfully did. But if my Iolaus should come, he would do more harm than good. When you have finished this story, this song and story, will you tell me whether Iolaus is any more Heracles' nephew than yours? Well, I suppose it will be best for me if I answer you, Dionysodorus, because you will not stop asking questions. I am quite convinced that, out of envious desire to prevent Euthydemus from teaching me that piece of wisdom, the answer. Well, uh, my answer is that Iolaus is the nephew, nephew of Heracles, but as for being mine, I don't see that he is in any way whatsoever, because my brother Patrocles was not his father. And Patrocles is your brother? Yes, indeed. We have the same mother, though not the same father. Then he is, both is and is not your brother. Not by the same father, my good friend, because his father was Chiridemus, and mine was Sophronicus. But Sophronicus and Chiridemus were both fathers? Certainly. The former was mine, and the latter his. Then was Chirodemus other than a father? Other than mine, at any rate. Then he was a father. Well, he was other than a father. Or are you the same as a stone? I I'm afraid you will show that I am, although I don't feel like one. 
Then you are other than a stone. Yes, quite other. Then isn't it the case that if you are other than a stone, you are not a stone? And if you are other than gold, you are not gold? That's true. Then Chirodemus is not a father if he's other than a father. So it seems that he's not a father. Because if Chirodemus is a father, on the other hand, Sophronicus, being other than a father, is not a father. So that you, Socrates, are without a father. <clears throat> well, isn't your father in just the same situation? Isn't he other than my father? Far from it. What? Is he the same? The same, certainly. I should not agree with that. But tell me, Euthydemus, is he just my father, or the father of everyone else as well? Of everyone else as well. Or do you think the same man is both a father and not a father? I certainly was of that opinion. What do you think that a thing can be both gold and not gold? Or both a man and not a man? But perhaps, Euthydemus, you are not uniting flax with flax, as the proverb has it, because you are making an alarming statement if you say that your father is the father of all. But he is. Just of men, of horses, and all other animals. All of them. And is your mother your mother? Yes, she is. And is your mother the mother of sea urchins? Yes, and so is yours. So you are both the brother of gudgeons and puppies and piglets. Yes, and so are you. And your father turns out to be a boar and a dog. And so does yours. You'll admit all this in a moment, Tessipus, if you answer my questions. Tell me, have you got a dog? Yes, and a brood of one, too. And has he got puppies? Yes, indeed, and they're just like him. So the dog is their father? Yes, I saw him mounting the bitch myself. Well then, isn't the dog yours? Certainly. Then since he is a father, and is yours, then the dog turns out to be your father. And you're the brother of puppies, aren't you? Do you beat this dog of yours? <laughs> Heavens yes, since I can't beat you. Then you beat your own father. <laughs> there would be certainly be much more reason for me to beat yours for taking it into his head to beget such clever sons. A few moments later. Now, Socrates, do you think you own your possessions? Yes, unless you forbid it, for my hopes must begin with you and end with Dinosaurus here. And do you consider those things to be yours, over which you have control, in which you are allowed to treat as you please? For instance, an ox or a sheep, do you regard these as yours because you're free to sell them or give them away or sacrifice them to any god you please? And if you could not treat them in this fashion, then they would not be yours? This is exactly the case. Uh, it is only things like these which are mine. Very well. You give the name of living beings to all that have a soul, don't you? Yes, that's correct. And you admit that only those living beings are yours, over which you have power to do all these things I mentioned just now. I admit it. Tell me, Socrates. Do you have a god? <laughs> <laughs> must admit that I do. Oh, so then Apollo and Zeus and Athena, you would call them your gods. My ancestors and my masters. But at any rate, they're yours. Or didn't you admit they were? Yes, I admitted it. What's going to happen to me? Then these gods are also living beings. Because you've admitted that everything which has a soul is a living being, or don't these gods have a soul? Oh, yes, they do. Then they are living beings. Yes, living beings. And you've agreed that those living beings are yours, which you have a right to give away and to sell and to sacrifice any god you please. 
yes, I agree to that. Uh, there's no retreat for me, Eustemus. Then come tell me straight away, since you admit that Zeus and the other gods are yours, that you have, have the right to sell them, or give them away, or treat them in any way you like, as you do with the other living creatures. <laughs> Two thousand years later. Everybody that you shot at that night you intended to kill, correct? I didn't intend to kill them, I intended to, t I intended to stop the people who were attacking me. By killing them? I did what I had to do to stop the person who was attacking me. By killing them? Two of them passed away, but I stopped the threat from attacking me. By using deadly force? I used deadly force. That you knew was going to kill? I didn't know if it was going to kill them, but I, I, used the, I used deadly force to stop the threat that was attacking me. You intentionally used deadly force against Joseph Rosenbaum, correct? Yes. You intentionally used deadly force against the man who came and tried to kick you in the face, yes. correct? You intentionally used deadly force against Anthony Huber, correct? Yes. You intentionally used deadly force against Gage Grosskreutz, correct? Yes. With regard to Joseph Rosenbaum, you fired four shots at him, correct? Yes. You intended to kill him, correct? I didn't intend to kill him. I intended to stop the person who was attacking me and trying to steal my gun. So we can see from this example uh, the kind of practice that sophists uh, that sophists promulgated, the kind of uh, the kind of thing that they taught, the kind of thing that they learned, and the kind of thing that they did. It was decidedly underhanded. It was precisely the kind of thing that we would uh, that we would expect from uh, cynical and ruthless politicians, lawyers, that sort of people. Um, those who are not concerned primarily with truth, either finding it or telling it, uh, but are rather concerned with advantage, whether for themselves or perhaps for clients or perhaps for uh, for their patrons, what have you, whatever the case might be. In the same dialogue, though, we find a contrast point. Uh, and as early on, uh, Socrates presents his own argument for why one ought to learn wisdom, why one ought to become wise, gain knowledge, seek truth for its own sake, why this is so important. And so the first small section of this dialogue serves as a kind of protrepticus, so it's called. Uh, this is a, uh, a long tradition among philosophers uh, in the classical world, that's both uh, both Greece and Rome and, and, and uh, some surrounding cultures as well, where a philosopher will provide a case, will provide an argument for why you want to study philosophy. Uh, and as such, it is one of the, uh, it is, I think, one of the best, because I think it does a fantastic job of, of illustrating why it is that wisdom is so important. Uh, this is a section that I won't read directly, but I will summarize. Uh, this part doesn't read quite as well and uh, needn't uh, needn't include so many funny voices as the previous one. Um, in this case, though, Socrates is arguing the usefulness of abstract knowledge. Now, abstract knowledge is meant to be useless. That is the entire point. Knowledge itself, of its own right, uh, sophia, wisdom, uh, as distinct from phronesis, or practical wisdom, applied knowledge. Abstract theoretical knowledge, sophia, is meant to be useless and yet Socrates is going to ultimately argue that it is the most useful thing that one can possibly learn, even more useful than Fronius' as practical knowledge, skill, uh, or even techne, uh, which uh, know-how, the ability to do things, and the uh, knowledge of how things work. And so his argument goes something, along, something like this. He asks us to think of what are things that are beneficial for us, what things, whether those are material things or immaterial things, would be useful for living a good life? It would be helpful for us. And so we begin with, with things like uh, the, the obvious sorts of things, like wealth, like power, like honor. This is really the big three, I think, in, in, in the tradition. And he goes a little more fine-grained as well to talking about uh, skills, right? ability to create things, to make things, tools for those, uh, for those skills. Uh, the ability to do things, the ability to uh, to make money, to uh, obtain power, to uh, to obtain to maintain honor or one's reputation, anything like that, 
all of these all of these things are seen as useful and they almost certainly are however socrates brings up what i think is the key of his argument which is to ask what good is anything if you do not use it so what good is money if it is not spent the answer is precisely nothing uh, to dive into a pool of it uh, like scrooge mcduck style uh, is not to use money it is a complete waste of it um, I, he discusses this elsewhere socrates that is uh, in the republic as well and i have a lecture on uh, on a subject similar to that um, which is worth with, worth noting so it will be in the description But anything that we have is only useful to us if it is applied, if it is used. And furthermore, if it is used properly. Not just properly in terms of uh, it, it accomplishes its goal, but it accomplishes the right goals, the kinds of goals that are conducive to our own flourishing. And so he goes a step farther, not just to say that something that is unused is useless, but to say that something that is misused is worse than useless. So if you have something, but you do not know how to use it, but you try to use it anyway, or if you have something and you have no particular goal in mind, but you try to use it anyway for what turn out to be uh, counterproductive goals, you're going to be harming yourself rather than helping yourself. And so therefore, you'd be better off leaving the thing alone. So use this as an example of carpenter's tools, so say a hammer and a saw. If you have no idea how to use it, or if you have no particular thing that you want to create with it, you can do a few things. You can use it for a particular purpose. You can come up with a goal and use your know-how and your tools of carpentry to create something, say a table or a chair. Or you can leave it alone. If you have nothing you want to do with it, and you have no idea how to use it, then you can leave the hammer and saw, the hammer and the saw on the table and not use them. You'll gain nothing, but you'll lose nothing as well. However, if you have no idea how to use these carpenter's tools properly, and you do not know exactly what it is that you're building or what it is that you need to build, but you decide to use them anyway, you will probably wind up damaging the tools, and you may even wind up hurting yourself, in some cases significantly. Um, there are certainly all sorts of tools, uh, all sorts of techniques that can be very dangerous if misused. To use a more modern example, think about driving a car. If you know where you're going and you know how to drive, a car is an incredibly, incredibly useful thing. But if you don't know how to drive, and you don't know where you want to go, then getting behind the wheel is an incredibly dangerous activity, one which is probably going to result in all sorts of tragedy. And so Socrates asks, what good are any things, any of these beneficial things, things that we think are beneficial, really, in themselves, intrinsically? Because it seems like they could be either useful if you know how to use them and what to use them for, or a useless if you don't know how to use them and don't use them, and they're, they're unused, they sit there just doing nothing. Or even they could be detrimental and harmful if you use them for the wrong thing or in the wrong way. And so ultimately he concludes that the only thing which is actually useful is the thing that we thought was useless, which is wisdom. That is, how to do things, and most importantly, what to do. Because we ask questions like, what am I to do with my life? What, is my, what goals should I have? What kinds of things will be conducive to my flourishing? Well, all of that involves wisdom. It involves a knowledge of ourselves, the kind of thing that we are. It involves a knowledge of the world around us. It involves a knowledge of our society. All of these things are addressed by philosophy, by the love of wisdom, not practical know-how not technique, not even applied knowledge, but abstract theoretical knowledge, Sophia, wisdom. And so wisdom, which is itself, in itself, only good for its own sake, turns out to also be the only thing which is useful necessarily for anything else. So he ultimately concludes that without wisdom, we would be better off not having anything else at all. But if you don't have access to something to screw up, then you're not going to be able to screw it up. This is the principle behind something like the lottery, uh, the lottery curse. Where, again, today, uh, this is actually a, a, a common problem, where people who win the lottery wind up destitute 
a very short time later. Usually within a year, they have less money than they had before they won, and often they're dead, because they have no idea what to do with it. Because they lack wisdom. Because most of us lack wisdom, really. And so without wisdom, would, we would be better off without all of these other things that we think are beneficial. Wealth, pleasure, power, honor, whatever it might be. Wisdom is the key. And this is why we ought to seek it. Well, because it's good for its own sake, but also because it's what, any, what makes anything else actually useful or actually good. All right. That's all I have for this lecture. So I encourage you to read the Euthydemus. Uh, it's one of the less no lesser known uh, uh, dialogues of Plato, uh, but I think it is uh, both, well, the section that we read, uh, that I, we read aloud, is, I think, at least, uh, phenomenally entertaining. Uh, and it really, uh, it really demonstrates the kind of thinking uh, that can be done without actual wisdom. And it also provides this wonderful Protracticus, this wonderful little uh, exhortation to philosophy uh, an introduction to why one ought to want to be wise. So until next time, thanks for watching.